After more than four decades, Gaddafi is no longer running oil-rich Libya. Despite all the threats, bombastic rhetoric and eccentric behaviour, the colonel, it seems, has lost. But exactly who has won the war? Stay tuned for the answers on the agenda. Colonel Gaddafi's reign as Libya's tyrant ruler is over. A brutal, unrelenting six-month civil war has seemed to that. But there are those who fear there's still more turmoil to come until the power vacuum is filled. While the Transitional National Council is recognised by more than 30 foreign powers, it's not hugely popular with some rebels and other militia who view the TNC with great suspicion. They know they only succeeded in liberating Tripoli because of NATO backing, and the last few days have shown that there are still major hurdles to overcome. Gaddafi's supporters are still resisting, partly out of fear that they are fighting for their lives and partly because they suspect they will lose their voice and become marginalised when a new government is finally formed. Today's agenda asks the question, Libya, Colonel Gaddafi has lost, but exactly who has won the war? Well, how will history judge the Libyan campaign and how do we define success and from whose point of view? These and many other questions will be answered uh, today by our roundtable trio, starting with Charles Crawford, who was British ambassador in Sarajevo, Belgrade and Warsaw at the height of diplomatic tensions in the region. He's now a private consultant, a much followed blogger and accomplished Twitter debater, although I'm sure he'll be using more than 140 characters today. Joining him is John Rees, editor of the left-wing online magazine Counterfire and co-author of the forthcoming book The People Demand, A Short History of the Arab Revolutions. A committed anti-war activist, he's also a strong critic of NATO's intervention in Libya. And our third guest is Libyan Sabri Malik from the Democratic Party. He's glad Gaddafi is out of power but is concerned about Western meddling in his country. Sabri, can you expand a little bit on your concerns? Yes, I can. Uh, Gaddafi has lost power in eastern Libya, and he has lost power in Tripoli, but he's not out of the picture yet. We are very thankful to NATO uh, for the great job they did, uh, but the military intervention on its own will not solve our problems. Not entirely, definitely. We need a political mandate now. We need the United Nations to come and help us. Now, uh, Libya is very unstable now. It's a fact that uh, some tribes, the Warfella tribes, the Tarhuna, the Hassauna, Ulad Sleiman, uh, Al Furjan, most of them are still supporting Gaddafi. This is why we are witnessing the killing is continuing in Tripoli. Now, we need the United Nations to mandate Mr. Tony Blair, who used to be an advisor, a personal advisor to Colonel Gaddafi, to approach him and to negotiate with him a way of, uh, of uh, stopping this civil war. What we are having now is a civil war in Libya. Well, let me bring in John Rees here, because um, I saw you bristle at the mention of Tony Blair, NATO, uh, UN. How, how do you respond to Sabri's concerns? Well, I think it takes a certain amount of chutzpah to recommend that the forces that have given us the catastrophe in Iraq and Afghanistan are automatically um, the people who should be sorting out the situation in Libya. The track record is not a good one to uh, to make an understatement of the of the situation, and that's the difficulty really. Um, in revolutionary upheavals, unlike other processes of change, uh, those people who do the liberating, by and large, get to do the ruling afterwards. If the Libyan people, um, like the Egyptian people, people or the Tunisian people have been the fundamental force at uh, work in the transformation, they had a chance at least of doing the ruling afterwards. If you rely on NATO, the chances are that the great powers will intervene, will pick and choose between who they want and who they like in the TNC, will award contracts, will 
campaign to have military bases, we'll uh, use the area as a strategic asset uh, in, the, in the area, and then the Libyan people will truly have lost their sovereignty. Well, Charles, I mean, you've been involved in a lot of tense diplomatic uh, situations. Uh, you've heard Sabri's concerns, John's criticisms of those concerns. A return for Tony Blair? Well, I wouldn't know whether he personally would be the right person or indeed whether he'd be interested or effective. I think one of the big things we have to understand is that sometimes societies which have had a very difficult time need outside help. And outside help can come in many forms. And I take there's a sort of left-wing criticism of, of uh, Western powers, if you like, but there's plenty of uh, criticism one might make of Eastern powers. You know, the role of uh, China and Russia in helping the Syrian regime at the moment is is very problematic, it seems to me. But anyway, I mean, I think there is a case for helping Libya move from this. I think there are precedents, um, good and bad, on how that could be done. If you look at how Cambodia made its transition, the UN helped there uh, in a very skillful way, I think. Bosnia, where I've had a lot of work, and perhaps Serbia, has been less successful. Um, it all depends on local conditions, and uh, to some degree, the, the incentive structure you build into the into the international programs. I think it's very easy to, to have a big political deal, which everyone says is a great success, which then unravels down the years to come because of little details in it. The way the voting system works, for example, in Bosnia, I think was a big mistake. In 96, we're seeing the consequences now of that. Very small detail, very big consequences. Well, Sabri, if I can go back to you, I mean, at the moment of recording, we have no idea whether Gaddafi is dead or alive. Um, but you think his influence or his legacy is going to live on. Surely there are elements in the rebels that won't allow that to happen. Uh, we know where Gaddafi is. He's still alive. He's uh, in Bin Walid, which is 100 miles to the southeast of Tripoli. He's under the protection of the Warfella tribe. This is the tribe uh, who, which formed the backbone of the Gaddafi regime over the 42 years. And they stood by him throughout our revolution, and uh, they fought with him till the, uh, till the end. And they are they want him to continue to lead Libya. This is where the problem is, and this is why I, I suggest that uh, the United Nations mandates Mr. Tony Blair. Gaddafi seems to listen to Mr. Tony Blair. We want to avoid a civil war in 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 the country. John, again, I mean, Tony Blair, can you see him as being a solution? This just isn't going to fly. I mean, not only would it not fly with uh, anybody um, in, the, in the region, I mean, Tony Blair is detested as the Middle East peace envoy in most of the countries in the, the Middle East, and he's not less detested after the Tunisian Revolution and after the Egyptian Revolution than he was before. So if you want to become instantly unpopular with your neighbours, and give Tony Blair a major role. But, but let's be clear about what was happening with, with Blair and Gaddafi in the first place. This was a, a marriage of convenience at, at best. Um, Gaddafi wanted to be re-included in the, in the club of acceptable powers uh, for the West. Uh, Tony Blair was uh, willing to uh, corrode his own uh, somewhat limited number of principles in order uh, to achieve this. The embrace in the tent in the desert was a, a, a put-up job on uh, both their behalves and the idea that once this is done it's paving the way for a successful intervention by Blair in the future of Libya post the fall of Gaddafi. I just, uh, I just don't think this is realistic. The point about Gaddafi's continuing strength or the strength of Gaddafi's uh, supporters still is that this was partly a product of the NATO intervention. The NATO intervention did the one thing which nothing else could have done. It made the supporters of, the, uh, of Gaddafi's regime consolidate themselves around him up to the point of NATO intervention. They were hemorrhaging away from the regime. At the point of NATO intervention, that halted because what he s was saying seemed to be true, that the TNC was the was the creature of the of the major powers, and that was the one thing which could make him look as if he was telling the truth. Would, where do you stand on NATO intervention? Was it a force for good? Well, there's all sorts of different forms of intervention. I think where I uh, take you know polite but strong issue with the last point is that one of the huge advantages of the current situation is that Libya doesn't have its weapons of mass destruction. These were given up as a direct result of the uh, intervention in Iraq, and they were given up as a result of British intelligence negotiating with the Libyan regime a new deal. Now, that's a huge, a huge change, mm -hmm. so that's one form of intervention. Personally, I think, uh, though I'm 
you know, I'm prepared to take advice I'll from colleagues. I'll have to intervene at this stage yeah. because uh, we've we've got a, a clip coming up. Um, I mean, Gaddafi's no longer calling the shots in Libya, but the continued resistance from the ranks of his depleted supporters is still a cause for concern. And as Mohammed Walji reveals, continued fighting is causing a humanitarian crisis. Viewers should be warned that you may find some of these images disturbing. As pockets of resistance and fighting continues in Libya, there are now increased fears of a humanitarian crisis. Civilians trapped in the fighting have been wounded in crossfire and are urgently seeking treatment in Libya's hospitals, most of which are now poorly resourced and almost out of supplies following the conflict. The main military offensive might be over, but there are still very real dangers caused by sporadic sniper fire around hospitals and medical centers, preventing medical staff and patients from entering, leaving exhausted doctors and nurses inside unable to cope with the huge intake of injured. The charity Medicine Sans Frontieres says it's expanding its medical response in western Libya to meet urgent humanitarian needs. An MSF-supported hospital in Yefren, about 130 miles southeast of Tripoli, has been inundated with wounded, the agency claims, putting huge stress on medical personnel. The International Committee of the Red Cross has also stepped up its emergency medical provision, saying that hospitals in the capital are struggling to cope with a number of casualties. Meanwhile, Amnesty International says it's concerned about the plight of thousands of migrant workers in the country who are also suffering in the ongoing conflict. The most vulnerable are workers from the sub-Saharan African countries who fear they'll be targeted for being wrongly perceived as being part of Gaddafi's mercenaries. Charles, I mean, NATO says that its role is to protect civilians, but that's not happening, is it? Well, I wouldn't say it's happening or not. I mean, I think quite a lot of civilians have clearly been uh, injured and killed in the you know, disastrous fighting that's gone on. The question is, would it have been even worse? And I suppose, you know, history will, you know, will judge on that. I think just going back to where we were before, one of the really difficult things in all these situations, whether it was in the so former Soviet Union, Bosnia, Serbia, any country having a transition, is what do you do with the people who are in the old system? How far down do you go in before you start saying, well, actually, you were there, but we'll keep you in the new system? It's very hard because there are you know, hundreds of thousands of people involved. Not all of them are, are bad people. And I think this is the drama we're seeing now, actually, is part of the conflict is former Gaddafi very senior people have now joined the rebels and are obviously hoping to stay in business. And, if, and, and there may be a lot of Libyans who think they don't, really don't want that. But Sabri, I mean, if we uh, look at uh, life in Libya when Gaddafi was in control, he controlled everything, everything from the major spend right down to the minute detail. So really, uh, now that he's gone um, out of power, Aren't the Libyans starting off with a greenfield site? Mm. We have a problem indeed in this respect. Uh, Western powers, especially the United States, want to impose on us the next regime in Libya. Their man is Mr. Mahmoud Jibril al Wurfali. He is the actual head of the, uh, of the TNC, uh, NTC. Now, Libyans are very suspicious of this man. We don't trust him. He used to be a minister of Gaddafi, and he was in charge of the, uh, uh, of the succession of safe to, to power. He worked for Gaddafi for 10, 10, uh, ten but years. But clearly that's not going to happen now. There it won't is, be a, a Gaddafi in control in Libya, surely. Well, Gaddafi is not in control in, of Libya. He's in control of some, some parts of Libya. Now, we want, in this time of crisis, we want legality. It's very important that we Libyans are united. The fact that Gaddafi's stooges and aides and ministers are still in charge of the NTC is a recipe for disaster. It is a recipe for fundamentalism. Well, let me throw this over to John, because th this is a complaint that we hear in Tunisia and Egypt as well, that the old regime or the, the thumbprints are still there. Yes, but the, the difference between the cases is that um, what military intervention did in the case of Libya was that it internalized those people and promoted them within the camp of the revolution. In e Egypt, there's a very clear distinction between 
the Republic of Tahir, as it's called, and the remnants of the regime, which are the military government, which are still running the country. There's a, a clear distinction between those people who are still in opposition to the way in which the transition is unfolding in Tunisia and the people from the old regime who are still off of it. So there's, there's road to run in those, in those revolutions. What the military intervention in Libya did was to institutionalise those people, to make them the interlocutors of military support. To what make would them have the, happened the without NATO intervention? Well, we don't know. We can't tell that. But um, one of the things that does tend to happen in civil wars is that always at the beginning there's an imbalance between the old state machine and the rebel forces. There's always a process by which the, the rebels at the beginning are less militarily capable, are less experienced and less organised, and they become so under the impact of having to fight the regime. That was, after all, actually in our own civil war in the 17th century. That's what happened here. It's what happened in the American Civil War. It's, it's a process which the revolutionary side goes through. What military intervention did uh, on uh, to, to this revolution was to cut off any possibility of that happening and to make into vassals of the uh, of the of the providers of uh, military forces uh, the people who had at first actually in Benghazi, of course, at first rejected them. There were banners all over Benghazi saying we can do it alone, no Western intervention. That was a process a, a process of the maturing of the revolution, which was cut short by the deliberate use of the civil war as a, an excuse for intervention by the Western powers. And, and we should never forget this happened simultaneously with the Western powers backing the Saudi crushing of the Bahraini uh, revolution. In fact, exactly the same states. In, the West, in Libya, the Western powers took the military lead and they were backed by the Gulf states. In Bahrain, the Gulf states took the lead and were backed by the Western powers. But exactly the same forces in different proportions intervened to end the revolutionary development in both cases. Charles, this all sounds very gloomy from John and from Sabri. Um, Gaddafi's gone, but, you know, again, looking at the, the question today is, who has won? Well, I think it can be gloomy. I mean, I think one of the points I was going to make was there, you, these countries are not doomed to succeed. There's no reason to think that after 40 years of sort of really more or less insane government of some sort, mis misrule, that things will be easy. Um, you know, look at the former Soviet Union. There's Mr. Putin, who is a former KGB man. He's now, you know, very influential over there. So the people who are in these former systems are tenacious and they're good. And some of them are very professional and know what they're doing. So it's no real surprise that they stay on. Well, let's head for the Agenda's electronic post room where Mohammed Walji selects the best Facebook responses to today's topic. Thanks, Yvonne. Well, responses to today's topic came thick and fast and reflected the diversity of views and opinions on Libya and who are the winners now that Gaddafi is no longer the leader. Oil was one of the biggest motivations according to many of you, including Abu Maymuna who wrote, Whoever is the first to get their bloody hands on the oil has, as they say, won the battle but not the war. They will never win the war. Londoner Farhat Dar fears the worst. He says, It's not only Gaddafi who was on the verge of losing, it's Libya all in all in the hands of the West. My God, they've been trying to get control over Libyan oil for a long time. It's the West making and supplying war weapons on both sides like everywhere else in the world. He goes on, Libya needs some Gaddafi figure to kick out the West from Libya and at the same time be good for his country and the Libyan people. Daniel Ashrafi says his biggest fear is that charities and foreign companies will cash in on the misery caused by war. He says, I just hope foreign private companies do not make a huge profit like they did after the 2004 tsunamis in Indonesia. As soon as there is chaos in some region, these same companies flock there to make profits. Ahmed Dugal from Nairobi in Kenya said, Big win for the West. The TNC will have to say yes to everything they ask for. That includes the oil and billions of dollars with them. However, Ishrath Ali insists, I believe the people of Libya have won. It was their own struggle that brought the downfall of Gaddafi. No matter what the US or UK or any country does, the people of Libya won't hold back from their fight for freedom. American-based Daniel Lodi from Denver in Colorado wants to see the Libyan people on the winner's podium. He says, this rebellion is for the Libyan people. If they were oppressed under Gaddafi, then they will be more oppressed under an unstable government or if a civil war breaks out amongst the rebels. Stability is the key. It will be a major loss if Western powers, NATO, US, etc., exploit the wealth and situation of the Libyan people. But American Farhan Akazi in Washington concludes solemnly. She says, No one has won. Nation building, or rather regime change, is a process that will take time and more lives will be lost. Well, that's all we've got time for. Back to you, Yvonne. 
Thanks for that, Mohammed. Well, in the last few minutes, let's get our guests' concluding remarks. If I start with you, Charles, um, who are the, the winners in this? I don't think you can tell yet, because I think if we have this uh, show 10 years from now, we'll, we'll see actually who won. Um, I think the Libyan people clearly have had a major uh, boost to their morale. I think there's a good prospect that some sort of normal situation, certainly an improvement on what was there before, will come. I, I th frankly think it's a bit depressing listening to some of your contributors talking about the West trying to grab Libyan oil. I was, I was listening to the radio yesterday. The Chinese seem to have a lot of oil contracts with Libyan oil. You know, Libyan but oil is a major asset. there is a lot of oil there. Absolutely, it is oil sure. Rich. No, sure. So, I, so I hope that Libya will have the advantage of having some of its own natural resources, be able to mobilise them. But I actually agree, I think, with Sabri that actually a role for the UN in just trying to create some degree of calm in the situation, and so that the Libyan people, you know, in a sense, with a little bit of relaxation, can have the chance to find for themselves who they want to lead them. It really would be a, a mistake, I think. I'd pick up your point if we, the West, whoever the West is, impose someone on Libya now. That would be a, you know, it might be a, a serious mistake. Sabri, who are the, the winners and why do you think that Libyan people are relying so much on the West? Why not the Arab world? The w Arab world is undemocratic. And uh, so far, none of the Arab countries has managed to establish a democracy. Establishing a democracy is a very difficult business. This is why we need the United Nations. We need the United Nations to mandate a commission to Libya. We call it the Adrian Belt Commission after the man who established Libya, Mr. Adrian Belt, uh, a Dutch uh, uh, lawyer who came to Libya in 1949 and established Libya, and we got our independence in 1951. We want a repetition of that so we can be held to establish uh, democracy. Now, I would like to add that there are very sinister figures coming to the scene now in the Libyan scene. For example, Major Abslam Jaloud, who was number two in Gaddafi's uh, coup, uh, Musa Kosa himself, the mass murderer, the head of the intelligence. He killed so many Libyans. He tortured so many Libyans. Now he wants a position in the uh, in the NTC. Mr. Abdurrahman Chalgam, Gaddafi's uh, foreign minister, he's already there. These are criminals. Uh, this is a recipe for disaster. If the West accepts this, then Libya will head for the civil war, no doubt. And at the end, w m thousands will die. And, and at the end, will end up with a Saudi. Uh, a Saudi-like uh, regime, uh, a Wahhabi country. Right. John, I mean, uh, quite gloomy. Charles says, come back in 10 years' time. 10 years is a long time to find out who's won. Yes, I think we'll know faster than that. Um, I, I think the point here is um, that uh, when we're talking about the interference of the major powers, and I include in that Russia and, uh, uh, and China, um, this will further destabilise the situation. This is the business of the Libyan people and only the Libyan people. And the intervention of the major powers, and I think people refer to the West because those are, of course, the powers at the moment who militarily intervened. Uh, in this uh, in this situation has destabilized and they will indeed the western powers will indeed accept exactly the people um, that uh, you've referred to as being gangsters and the reason that they we can be certain they will accept them is because they already did when they were in the Gaddafi regime they already made a deal with these people and they will make a deal with these people again if they're given the chance to do so I think the the, the chance for the Libyan people is that having got rid of Gaddafi they now form a powerful enough uh, uh, thrust to the revolution to say, get out. We asked you to do this job. You finished this job, even by your own definition. Now leave us, leave us alone. One thing that we should no longer have to put up with or listen to from anybody about the Arab world is that they're incapable of dealing with their own dictators. Well, that is one proof that the Arab Spring has already obviously provided. Obviously, lots of different opinions there. Nothing uh, too optimistic. Uh, but that just remains for me to say a very big thank you for your analysis and we'll see you all soon on the next Agenda.